Hey, I'm Trey. Today's story is about a killer that kept himself entertained by sexual assault and torture that was used to also kill his victims. If you enjoy more stories such as these, I upload new content every Tuesday and Thursday. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please leave them in the comment section because I'm always looking forward to your input. Well, if you're ready, let's get started. 1946 in the country of France, a man by the name of Pierre Chanel was born. No youth or family dynamic was available, but as an adult, Pierre joined the military. Pierre was very ambitious and would show his bravado to his colleagues and his superiors. He eventually worked his way up through the ranks and became a chief warrant officer. For those who don't know, being moved through the ranks so fast is an absolute honor. Only a small percentage of all military soldiers ever accomplish this task. For most of those who do accomplish this task, it may take their entire career to move as fast as Pierre did. This feat takes a combination of exceedingly good performance and high written recommendations from other superior officers. He worked out continuously and kept himself in perfect physical shape. He would jog over half a dozen miles each day. This was alleged but not confirmed, but some of his colleagues believed that he was a little crazy because he always spoke about staying in shape so that he could be prepared to kill someone during combat. This guy doesn't sound crazy at all. Totally normal to me. Pierre loved the skydive and was extremely proficient in hand-to-hand -hand combat fighting. At some point, he was dispatched as a UN peacekeeper and saw combat in Lebanon during his tour. He also won several medals due to his excellent performance. At the time, some of his superiors and subordinates were so impressed with his work, so Pierre was then put in charge of training the new recruits. Fast forward to the year of 1988, in the small town of Busseries, which is a very rural part of France. The highway administration was working on a large project in the area. The actual location where the construction was taking place was at a far end of a dead-end road. Employees would work during the daytime hours and would park their personal vehicles at the far end of this road. Later, during the evening hours, the heavy construction equipment would be left in place of the employees' personal vehicles at the end of that same dead-end road. Environmental activists were known to frequent the area and deliberately cause damage to the employees' personal vehicles during the daytime and also the heavy construction equipment during night. It was common for the authorities to frequent this dead-end road in order to protect the personal property of the workers during the day and also the company's expensive construction equipment from being stolen or vandalized at night. One evening during the month of August, Police officers were on routine patrol and decided to make a security check at the construction site. The road is completely dark with no street lights and is completely isolated. As the two officers approached the road, they observed a personal vehicle parked at the far end of this dead end road. The vehicle's lights were off and there was no movement. This was considered strange since it was at night and no one was supposed to have any reason for being anywhere near this area. The officers probably assumed that it was an environmental activist. In some extreme cases, these environmentalists have been known to be violent in some situations, even kill. So these officers moved cautiously and closer until they observed a man sitting in the driver's seat of the car. I'm sure that the officers believed that they may have stumbled into something that could become deadly. The officers didn't know if this guy was all alone or if someone was hiding out in the darkness and watching the officers approach the car, possibly preparing to ambush them. When they finally got to the car window, the police officer asked the stranger to produce some ID, in which he did. When the officers checked the stranger's ID, the man was identified as Pierre Chanel. The officer then asked him what was his business down this dark, dented road all alone and he responded that he was just a tourist on vacation leave from the military. He also explained that he was an officer and where he was stationed at in the military.
for obvious reasons, the officers didn't quite believe this guy's story, being on a dead end road in the middle of the evening, claiming to be a tourist. You know something? I think these officers misjudged this guy. Most tourists drive down dead end roads all the time at night and stare into the pitch darkness for fun. The officers then decided to press Pierre for more information while looking through the car windows for any type of clues to substantiate or disprove his claims. When the officers got to the back seat of the car, they saw the head of a man sticking out from underneath a blanket. The driver was immediately pulled out of the car for safety reasons. When the officers began to remove the blanket off the man in the back seat, they noticed that the man's neck and ankles were tightly chained together, purposely constructed to cause him to choke himself if he were to move around. The man's mouth was gagged to prevent him from speaking or making noise. Pierre was immediately placed in handcuffs. The victim was a 20-year-old Hungarian man who was identified as Palas Falvi. When he was untied and the gag removed, he told the officers that he had been hitchhiking all alone the previous day when Pierre offered him a ride. Pierre then used his hand-to-hand -hand combat skills to subdue this man. When the man was incapacitated, that's when Pierre tied him up and sodomized him repeatedly over the course of the evening. Pierre then took several pictures of himself as he raped the victim. When the police searched the car, a bag filled with sex toys and a camera was found. The police took the camera and analyzed the photos. Several photographs of the actual rape were captured and which confirmed the victim's story. It was believed that Pierre saved the photographs as souvenirs. The photos also proved that Pierre forcibly used some of his sex toys on the victim. Pierre was charged, found guilty, and given a 10-year jail sentence for kidnapping and sexual assault of the one confirmed victim by the name of Palsas. The military did everything possible to distance themselves from Pierre. They wouldn't answer any questions about Pierre or provide any information to the media. It was believed that Pierre was completely mortified and embarrassed after being apprehended by the authorities. He requested to be placed in solitary confinement during his prison sentence. While Pierre was in prison, the police decided to investigate all local disappearances in the area to see if there was any type of connection. They found that five soldiers and two civilians, who all happened to be men, had just gone missing near the same military base that Pierre was stationed at. All of these disappearances took place over the course of several years when Pierre was stationed there. A psychological profile was completed on Pierre and it was determined that he met the profile of a serial killer but no specifics were provided. Unfortunately, many of the disappeared victims were never located. The authorities did locate the bodies of three men who had been reported missing buried in separate locations in the same general area as the military base. Pierre was finally released in 1995, but the authorities did not cease their investigation on the disappearances that they believed were connected to him. The police believed that he was responsible for as many as 17 disappearances of young men near the area where Pierre was stationed in the military. At least six of those soldiers Pierre had personally trained during basic training. Because there was no bodies, the authorities had no evidence to hold him accountable for any of them. Out of all those missing people, only three bodies were recovered. The three were killed prior to Pierre being captured. There was only circumstantial evidence to link Pierre to the three murdered victims. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough evidence to formally charge Pierre for the three victims. Basically, the government felt that it was a waste of time to charge Pierre with the little evidence that they had on him because no jury would convict him on just circumstantial evidence. The military was even more embarrassed about their own missing soldiers who may have been kidnapped by Pierre, raped and murdered, possibly under their noses. The military attempted to label the missing men as just deserters without investigating any further. This infuriated many of the parents believing that their children were responsible young adults that would never run away, love their country, 
and were honorable soldiers. The mother of one of those recovered soldiers by the name of Eroline O'Keefe vowed to never give up the fight to bring her son's killer to justice. Since the time that Pierre was first identified as a suspect, she was determined to go to court and fight to have him charged for her son's murder. She was determined to force the government to charge Pierre with the circumstantial evidence that they did have on him. After a 15 year legal battle, Miss Eroline fought and won in 2002 for Pierre to be charged for her sons and the two additional murder victims found. Pierre was rearrested and charged for the three additional murders. During his incarceration and while he was on trial, he took his own life by slashing his wrist. If you enjoy more stories such as these, just click one of the suggested videos above. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and notification button so you can be reminded of new content that I upload every Tuesday and Thursday. God bless and stay safe.